This is a special presentation of AreaCable.com in the Area Guides Network, produced by CraigShip.com, with special guests from around the globe. I'm Peter McDermott, and now on to our feature presentation. Okay, Matthew, take it away. Hello, and welcome everybody to Conservation Live. If you didn't know, I'm Matthew Wilkinson from safaritalk.net and joining me tonight is an expert panel of conservationists who I'd like to introduce to you now, Chris Mercer. Hello, that's me. Introduce yourself, Chris. Oh, I'm a, an, an author and a wildlife rehabber. I'm also the director of the campaign against canned hunting, and uh, I function in South Africa. We have Diane joining us from the USA. Welcome, Diane. Good to be here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, um, I'm a modest little person living in North Georgia, and I have a, a small poetry publishing uh, house that I run with my uh, poet and partner friend, Robert S. King, and uh, we, we basically publish poetry, but we're very interested in a lot of things, which is why I'm here. Excellent, and it's nice to have you aboard. No, Peter, good to be here. Peter Milton from South Africa. Welcome, Peter. Hey, Matt. Um, I'm Peter Milton. Uh, I'm with a company called uh, Strategic Protection of Threatened Species. It's a conservation company based um, down in South Africa. Excellent. Sandy, welcome aboard. Thanks, Matt. I'm Sandy Skepis from Colorado in the United States, and I'm a member of the Serengeti Watch team and uh, an avid traveler to Africa. I just got back from spending five weeks over there, so sorry to be home. Wish I was still over there. Shreyas Mantry, live from the New York area. Welcome aboard. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Shreyas. Uh, I live in the New York metro area. Uh, I originally hail from India. Been involved uh, a little bit in conservation stuff uh, back in India and uh, now whenever I can uh, in the States. Uh, and I'm uh, actively involved with uh, this project called Serengeti Lion Project run by University of Minnesota. I have volunteered slash collaborated with them to help them uh, with a few uh, things that they are doing. It's a wonderful resource. So check it out. Tony Park, novelist and raconteur, welcome aboard. Thanks, Matt. My name's Tony Park. I'm the author of eight novels set in Africa and three biographies, and I'm coming to you live tonight through the National Park. And we have uh, Mauro. Where are you from, Mauro? Can you hear us? Okay, we don't have anything from Mauro. So, I'd like to uh, open up tonight's discussion. We're going to look at um, the business of conservation. With new luxury development planned for Kruger, Kruger National Park, recent raves for 10,000 people in Oldsgate National Park, and more recently Nairobi National Park, and planned development for Manor Pools in Zimbabwe, are we over commercializing our wilderness areas? And we are talking about Kruger National Park, so we'll go straight to Tony, who's actually there. Yeah, Matt, um, I've, I've given this matter quite a bit of uh, thought, and uh, I'm quite prepared to play devil's advocate on this one tonight. Um, I, I will say that, you know, there's a couple of plans for hotels in the Kruger Park. There's uh, one plan for Malala down in the South Park, and uh, a big development plan in Skakuza. If, if I could just briefly put those into context, uh, the Skakuza development has come about because of an overdevelopment already in Skakuza. They've built a huge um, conference centre in the main camp of Kruger National Park, which is Skakuza. 
and that's actually had a detrimental effect on the existing accommodation because it's proving popular. A lot of people, particularly from within the National Park Service, are coming to conferences in Skakuza and taking up accommodation or not being able to find accommodation. So there's actually a need for more accommodation in that camp, even though a lot of people are opposed to it. If Malalaan, the National Parks Authority, wants to uh, let a lease to build a hotel there. Now, I am not. And this is why I want to set myself up as a devil's advocate. I, I'm pro-development and I'm pro-commercialisation within acceptable boundaries. Um, I don't think the development of a new hotel at Malalan in the south of Kruger is a good idea because I've got a lot of friends who work in the existing private concessions within Kruger, which were only set up only about sort of 10 or 12 years ago. Now, these were parcels of land within the park that were let out by national parks as a money-making venture um, and private lodges were established within the park. I, I, I'll go on the record by saying I was initially very opposed to that um, from a philosophical point of view, but I've come around to thinking it's actually been a very good use of, uh, of public resources and a very good use of the land within Kruger. It hasn't impacted on the rest of the park. It's been a relatively successful uh, project in terms of generating revenue for the national park system. Now, the idea of developing a hotel at Malalan in the park is actually going to be in competition with the existing leases for concession inside the park. So, um, it, 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 it doesn't really come down, I don't think, to over-commercialisation. It comes down to what is an appropriate level of development in a, a national park. I, I'm relatively confident Sand Parks, the South African National Parks, will go through all of the due diligence required to make sure these developments are environmentally acceptable. Um, I just question the, the commercial uh, thinking behind wanting to have more development when it's actually going to cost you in the long run. I mean, if, if a hotel is developed in the south of Kruger, it will actually take business from the existing private concessions, which are by and large doing quite well. So. I think we have to separate this issue away from the environmental side of things. I think we have to separate it from the conservation side of things. I, I, I would not question these developments on a conservation basis. I would question them perhaps on an economic basis. And just if I could briefly finish by talking about mana pools, I've stated a couple of uh, the very nice uh, private lodges on the Zambian side, Zambezi River, opposite mana pools National Park in Zimbabwe. There's nothing on the, or very little on the um, on the Zim side on the mana pools side. Uh, again, I'm personally not in favour of overdevelopment of many national parks and certainly not minor pools, but I, I wouldn't deny the Zimbabwean National Park Service the ability or the opportunity to perhaps capture back some of that tourism trade that has gone across the border into Zambia in the last few years. Chris, how would you reply to Tony's overview of the Kruger developments? Uh, Tony, I would prefer to look at the environmental impact. Um, I've had experience of traveling in the Kalahari at night uh, and I can tell you that if you don't want to kill animals you have to travel so slowly that you actually almost never get where you're going. So um, whilst you concentrated on the economic aspects I would prefer to look at the environmental aspect and say it cannot be a good thing to have more and more vehicular traffic uh, traveling in wild areas particularly at night and especially uh, with people from the cities who are not aware uh, of the fact that animals like to use the roads. So uh, I think that um, other than tour vehicles where the drivers are trained to travel slowly and to look out for little families of bat-eared foxes and so on um, on the road at night, um, I would prefer to see uh, vehicle traffic actually banned uh, after sunset or in late afternoon, uh, late evening. Yeah, I'd agree with you on that, Chris. I mean, to, to be fair to the Park Service, both the hotel developments that are planned in Kruger are at gates. They are on the extremities of the park. I, I would uh, certainly agree with you 100% in terms of that. And I would have to say that having spent uh, quite a lot of uh, the last 16 years staying in, um, in the Kruger Park, that the, 
probably the number one offender when it comes to running down animals at night time are probably national park staff travelling from camp to camp. Yeah. And Peter, um, what are your thoughts on, on development in Kruger and other national parks in South Africa? Is it a good or a bad thing? I oh, met, um, you know, as a conservationist, we would prefer to see no development whatsoever, but we, you know, we've got to be reasonable and accept and understand that these parks uh, have to become uh, more self sustaining. Um, I just believe that the South African government probably isn't doing enough. Um, you know, if you consider that Kruger's had its budget, operating budget cut kind of three or four years in a row, um, you know, they, they have to find ways of, of, uh, of bringing in revenues. Um, as long as a lot of that revenue goes back into conservation, I guess that, you know, the argument um, would probably be in favour from a lot of people of, of undertaking developments. And then secondly, as long as they're done um, with conservation and, and uh, ecological modelling in mind, um, I guess, you know, Kruger is 2 million hectares and a lot of people already sort of feel that um, it's, it's nothing more than a, a 2 million hectare zoo. Uh, I, I would beg to differ. Um, I think that it still forms a, a huge uh, conservation base in, in Southern Africa and maybe one of the few that um, will uh, stand as a model in, into the future. But we've just got to manage these things very, very carefully. Pete, I, I, I think you've, you've uh, raised a very interesting point there as well too with, with, um, uh, in, in terms of the impact on the, on the park and the size of the park. Well, one thing that I have picked up from the guys that worked in the concession, the existing private concessions that were made a few years ago, is that they are monitored and audited to an extremely strict and rigorous degree by sand parks in terms of looking after the vegetation, not only the wildlife in their areas. They also conduct anti-poaching patrols in their, in their own areas. I think, I think there's a good model in place in Kruger that could be perhaps applied to other national parks where if you let the concession, you don't just let it for money. Uh, you make sure that the custodians or the leasees of, of those particular concessions are as involved in terms of conservation and protection of the wildlife and the landscape uh, as, as a national parks person would be. I, I think it almost extends the reach of the park service into those uh, areas that were perhaps remote and perhaps overlooked and perhaps not patrolled in the past. Um, while I said uh, initially that I was a bit, I, I'm not anti-development, I, I think a, a hotel development is not that. A, a hotel development is just a purely commercial prospect of National Park. I think we also need to separate those out as well too. But I love the fact that you said that you don't agree with the fact that Kruger is just a big zoo because it's not. It is actually a very well-run National Park and I think if it's run the right way it can be a model for the rest of Africa in terms of the private-public partnership. Uh, yeah, Matthew, can I come? Oh, sorry. Carry sorry, on, Chris. Chris, if you don't mind, let me do the Tony. Uh, you know, it's. Um, I think that uh, you know w what you've said, dead right. Um, I, I, the important thing as well is that Kruger is serving as a role model for uh, you know a lot of private enterprise. Um, if 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 you consider Welkerfunden, for instance. Um, you know, Valkefonden is uh, minute in comparison to Kruger, but already Valkefonden right throughout the, the whole Waterberg area is standing as a really good example of how you can encourage tourism, um, but still uh, play a major role in the conservation of, of, of varying species, uh, threatened and unthreatened. So, you know, Kruger in incredibly well managed. Um, I just feel that the, the South African government needs uh, to consider the role of Kruger um, in its drive forward towards eco and green tourism and right now they're not doing that. You can't be, you can't be standing on the green platform um, you know, exciting a lot of worldwide interest in, in green and eco tourism and budget cutting in, in, in your flagship. Uh, to me it's ludicrous. Uh, if I can carry on from that, uh, Peter, 
Um, I have a problem with the way Kruger is run uh, in two respects. First of all, um, I'm against hunting in in any form, but in particular in a national park. And obviously there are other people who feel the same way as me because there's actually a legislative prohibition on hunting in national parks, as uh, Peter, as you probably know. So how they've got around that is by dropping the fences of Kruger on the western border and allowing the Kruger Park animals to roam onto private land. Sabi Sands, Timbavati, Umbabat, uh, Baluli, etc., the uh, Association of Private Nature Reserves. And I actually had a meeting with the chairman of the Association of Private Nature Reserves to discuss this very issue because it troubled me that wildlife, which was part of our national wildlife heritage and protected by legislation, was being permitted to roam freely onto private land where it was being hunted for the uh, private gain, uh, uh, the private profit of those private landowners, many of whom are the richest people in South Africa and certainly don't need the money. Yeah, Chris, I think uh, Chris, I think that has been a problem. Um, you know, the, the the whole issue of of, of dropping fences can can be uh, it can be disguised. Um, to be quite honest, um, there has been a certain measure of that. But I think that areas like, for instance, um, you know, Olifant's uh, Olifant's River Game Reserve, which you know, has, has again uh, been incredibly well managed. I, you know, I think we've got to allow uh, time for all of those issues to to get sorted out and settled. I agree with you that uh, hunting of, of, of any form um, of Kruger animals or of sand parks animals should not be allowed. Uh, on that, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, we're saying, well, you know, how do you expand um, Kruger into into the surrounding areas, and I, you know I think there's there's a large requirement for that as well. Um, the hunting issue incredibly difficult. Uh, you know again it comes back to a measure of a lack of control in the Department of, of Environmental Affairs. Um, issuing issuing of licenses for the hunting of uh, threatened or the major species uh, should should just not be allowed at the moment. Um, you know we've seen huge problems with uh, the amount of graft and corruption going on in the issuing of licenses, and their rhino stand as a as a major example. And I think until all of that is sorted out, uh, a moratorium should be placed on on hunting of. Uh, of satellite reserves attached to, to Kruger. The argument that they would pose, of course, is that um, reluctantly as a conservationist, I would agree that hunting can play a role in conservation. Um, that, that is the pro argument. It's well, you know, if you have foreign hunters coming in, um, they're generating revenue and that revenue should be going back into conservation. The question is how much of it actually does um, and how much of it is for just pure private gain. Until we've got a handle on all of those problems, any hunting or issuing of hunting licenses, whether that be for culling purposes or anything else, should be shut down in and around uh, Kruger and its, uh, and its associated reserves. Sandy, with your work um, in the Serengeti, do you agree that um, the proposed highway will lead to further commercialization of the um, of, of the park, or do you think it, it will it will only act as a, a byway for for uh, traffic to get from one side to the other? Well, we have done you know extensive research into this and. It's 60 kilometers because I, I was actually there a few weeks ago and I documented the road from beginning to end. We stopped every three kilometers so I could take a GPS reading and take photos of the existing road the way it is. 
um, we're fearful that if they do decide to gravel it, which it is not graveled at all, or if they do decide to tarmac it, that it will increase commercialization because they're going to put in petrol stations, probably rest places, gift shops. I mean, it's, you know, with roads come progress, inevitably. It's just the nature of the beast, you know, no pun intended, but it will increase commercialization in that area, no doubt in our minds. And Shreyas, with your own um, experience in Ranthambore in India, a lot of people complain that the Indian national parks are very over commercialized and there's um, too many tourists being driven round by inexperienced or unqualified drivers. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, and uh, if we do a quick Google search on maybe Google Images or wherever, uh, just showing like tourists uh, in Bandhavgarh National Park or Ranthambore, it's it's a sheer disaster. Uh, even in front of the uh, like gates, you get uh, I think uh, there's a quota now that only so many cars can go each day within the national park, and uh, it's a mess. The place is being uh, is very small. It cannot house uh, a lot of uh, tourists in one go, and they uh, there have been talks to expand the boundaries of Renthambore National Park, as shown in this uh, uh, documentary recently done, uh, uh, Broken Tail. If anybody has watched it, uh, a tiger's journey, uh, quite a touching documentary, and it also shows being shot in 2003, I believe. Uh, the work is still under progress to expand the limits of uh, 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 the national park, but the irony is that, again, the way it uh, works with the Maasai land, that you'll have uh, neighbors as residents, uh, human population that occupies a lot of area. They have their cattle, and if a leopard or a, a tiger goes astray, uh, I, I think last year during this time, uh, one of the very good uh, biologists come conservationists from Ranthambore, Tarvendra Kandal. Uh, Matt uh, knows him. Uh, in his work, he has shown that two tigers were poisoned by uh, giving them uh, the bait of goats because they were killing goats. And uh, imagine that we are fighting with uh, a number of 1,400 to 1,600, as they say, which I don't agree that if that is a correct count today in India. But the tigers are being killed like that, leave aside poaching. So yes, it is definitely an issue and uh, we can always uh, come up with uh, suggestions and solutions till the time uh, the grassroots level of the people who are living in and around Ranthambore area are much more compassionate towards the existent, uh, existence of uh, the species. Kenya Wildlife Service, um, they, they, they have recently held um, a rave for 10,000 people in the Hell's Gate National Park and this weekend just passed they held a similar event in Nairobi National Park and they claim that it brings attention to wildlife conservation they claim that it, it introduces local people to the national parks by bringing them in as, as entertainment uh, loud music um, barbecues Beer, so on and so forth. Is this the way to drive uh, attention to national parks? Is should we be using our national parks as entertainment centres for weekends? I'll put that question to Chris. Uh, we're never going to be able to stop it. Uh, because it's a commercial demand and money always speaks loudest but as an environmentalist of course I deplore that because there is always an impact on the wildlife when you have human traffic in a wildlife area and Sandy what do you think I'm totally against something like that. I don't think there's a necessity to have the commercialization in national parks to an extent of being a rave. 
there are other means and methods to get the word out to people that you know conservation is important. But having barbecues and parties and loud music in a natural environment where there's wildlife, I think, is detrimental to the wildlife, and the impact is detrimental. I mean, you know, talk about extreme habituation. I, I mean, what are they trying to do to the to the wilderness area by having big parties, throwing all this stuff? having the trash, having the noise. I mean, it's counterproductive to, to what wilderness is about and what conservation is about, in my humble opinion. Tony, you're, you're, you're actually at Pretoriscop at the moment, I believe. When I was last at Skakuza, the, the, the biggest rest camp in Kruger, at night, all you could hear was music, was loud noise, was people stumbling about. Um, you weren't able to hear really the wilderness you weren't able to hear the hyenas you weren't able to hear even the hippos in in the the, the river there do you do you think that increased numbers of, of people um, in these rest camps is a good idea is 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 making more bed numbers the way to go or should there be smaller camps dotted around to increase the overall bed numbers but in in less uh, more in, in smaller smaller areas. Yeah, Matt. Look, look, look oh, this is something I feel really strong about, and and, and I want to pick up uh, on on things that a couple of other people have said, not in a in a confrontational way. But I, I would just like to put my views on the record here. I I don't think you can live in a bubble. Uh, in Australia, where I come from, um, we have these national parks that are locked up. I mean, there is nothing inside an Australian national park in terms of facilities, in terms of camping, in terms of roads or whatever. And the Greenies and the, and the, the Minister for the Environment think this is a fantastic thing. But these, these parks are inaccessible. I mean, they exist as wilderness area for what? To protect a few kangaroos and, and feral animals that end up having to be culled. Now, I think that what we need to do in this debate is we need to, to separate commercialism uh, from development and from conservation, with conservation being paramount. The fact that the Kruger National Park, the fact that there are, Peter will know better than I, se several thousand rhinos in this national park is because it is a very well run national park. It is because it's a national park where when you go for a drive, you will see rangers on patrol all of the time. And the reason why it exists, and this is this this harks back to something Peter mentioned before. Yes, the national parks have had their budgets cut, and so they are looking for ways to raise revenue because they can't rely just on being subsidised by government funding. So they do have to box clever. They do have to be smarter and more commercial. You can't have one without the other. You can't have a wildlife paradise locked away with no source of income coming in. Matt, yes, Skakuza is a busy camp. Um, you do have people partying in there. Pretoria's Cop, where I am tonight, there are probably 50 or 60 families staying around me tonight. I would estimate of those 50 or 60 families, that apart from Nicola and I, maybe three or four other couples that are here are foreigners. This park is supported by locals and it's for locals. Now, a lot of locals will tell you there's too many foreigners coming in. I, I'll, I'll dismiss that because I think the strength of South African National Park is that they've been developed and they've been geared up for the domestic tourism market and that is what keeps them afloat. Um, you, it, it would be nice to say that you can never have a tar road through a national park and you can't have a service station, you can't have a shop or a restaurant in there, but that national park is probably going to disappear um, and so will the wildlife within it. Um, national parks do these days, I mean we're, we're in the age of privatisation, we're not in the age of government subsidising every public service. National parks do need income. Of course development needs to be managed in a sensitive manner, it needs to be managed in an environmentally sensitive manner. I have been to plenty of national parks in Africa, Southern Africa and East Africa, that are touted as wildlife paradises, and the only ranger you will ever see is the guy on the gate collecting the money. That is not the case in Kruger. This is a national park where people come in for the weekend, like tonight, they have a good time, they're in their rest camp, um, they, they enjoy a shop, they, they can fill up their car with the, from the petrol station in the national park's camp, they can go to a restaurant if they want. It's also a national park where if you drive out there on the roads and you do the wrong thing, as people quite often do, people do silly things in national parks, 
as well as there being rangers around, there will be 50 or 60 other South African locals who will take your picture and report you to the National Park Service for having done the wrong thing. So this is a good model and no roads here and development in the National Park does not make it a bad place. The fact that there are a million odd visitors in Kruger per year and lots of people here tonight every day of the year does not make this a zoo that doesn't make it a bad National Park. It National Park that in the absence of government funding can probably still chug along. So I think let's take off the hair shirt, let's take off this idea that we need to fence off these areas and not let anybody in or keep it for a few privileged few like many of us who could perhaps afford to go or get a freebie there. Let's make these parks accessible to everyone, control it and manage it and that comes down to the National Park staff and how they manage the conservation side of the park and how they control that side. Kruger is a well-run park. It is a park where if you do the wrong thing, you will get in trouble. There are speed cameras on those tar roads. <laughs> you will get fined. Uh, and if it's not the National Park Service, it'll be a South African citizen who will pull you up and tell you you're doing the wrong thing. I'll get off my soap. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, the points you've made there, Tony, um, lead me into my next question, which is, should we look or should African countries look at high cost and low numbers for their tourism uh, model or should they look at high numbers but low cost? What do we think of that? Please let me say I favour the latter. <laughs> Peter? Yeah, I'd go with Tony on that one. Um, certainly the latter. Uh, yeah, it, unfortunately, we we always. I mean, we're going to be looking at a at a question of balance. You know, the the, the key issue being that we as we as men. I mean, we've created the boundaries. Um, you know, two million hectares of Kruger sounds huge. Uh, in terms of animal migration, it isn't. Um, and you know, those parks have to be sustainable. Um, and they have to be made more accessible to to a the domestic market, but also to to tourist dollar. Uh, Kruger is incredibly well managed. Um, sure, it has its challenges, as uh, they were pointed out earlier on. But you know, the minute you drop a fence, if 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 you've got a a, a satellite reserve uh, bordering on a major one, if you drop a fence, animals are going to migrate in, and then you're in a situation where well, you're holding capacity. Pick an antelope species, just say it was kudu. Your holding capacity on the satellite reserve uh, for kudu is, say, 150 units. Again, pick a number. And all of a sudden, you've got an influx in and you're sitting at 220, 230. Well, you're going to have to do something about that. And the cost of capture and relocation of those species is uh, is not insignificant. So I think Kruger, together with um, its surrounding uh, reserves, are, are, are doing a, a very good job. Um, they're conservation focused. Um, but the point is again that you know the more accessible you make uh, these parks, um, the more you're going to have the conservation fraternity. And met a guy like you, you go to a park, you want to be hearing Ahina at night, you want to be hearing the Franklin calling, and you know the hippos and zebras and what have you. And it's disturbing to you if 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 you don't hear those noise, uh, th those night sounds because of. You know, a lot of entertainment noise, and it's a case of getting the balance right. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we're far off from from Kruger just um, having a cut-off time in certain of the parks where, you know, if if you are creating a noise, um, you're going to get visited by a ranger to tell you to to quieten down. Um, recognition has to be given to everyone's uh, requirements and 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 their right to share in those parks. Yeah. What, what do you think about the Botswana model then, where um, camps charge $1,000 per person per night, a, a lot more, because they, they run the high cost and low number model, which is, has a less impact on the environment, but means only a select few can really I enjoy the wilderness of, of the country? It's a joke. I don't because. think it is a joke. I don't think it is a joke. It's yeah. working for Botswana. 
It's not they're they're getting, they're getting the people. The people are in there. It's not like they're they're hurting. Um, mm -hmm. If it's working for them, then let it work for them. If it what works for Kruger works for Kruger. It doesn't have to be the same model for every part. So I hats off to Botswana. I think they're doing a terrific job. Tony, uh, look, I mean, I've been into camps in the Okavango, and uh, where uh, technically off-road driving, if allowed, is discouraged, and I have seen absolutely no control whatsoever over the antics of safari guides in the Okavango Delta. I've seen guys actually bulldozing uh, vegetation. I've, I've personally been involved in situations where there've been eight or nine vehicles. This is the sort of stuff that people, you know, regularly poo poo the Maasai Mara for. I, I was in a in a situation where we had eight land cruisers surrounding a female leopard and preventing her cub from getting to her so that people could get good pictures. And the reason that happens is because once you get into Marimi, into the Delta, into some of these private concessions, is that there's no regulation. There are no Botswana Wildlife Authority rangers patrolling those areas. Um, it's left to the run the people who run these you know sort of low impact high yield tourism operators to do their own thing and they do do their own thing if you if you look at the South African equivalent of that a private concession within Kruger is audited by the National Park staff and environmental officers if a if a ranger this is not a joke this is not an exaggeration this is, this is something I've seen if somebody drives off road within one of the private concessions in Kruger they have to GPS the location of any shrub or tree that they drive over so that they can later on go and replant another one or remediate the area. That, believe me, does not happen in the Okavango Delta. I mean, you, these things are, are, are good in theory, but in, in, in practice, if they're not enforced, and, and, and I think this is where it, where it comes down to the administration of the National Park Service. You know, I, I'm not in favour of the hotel that's going to be built in, 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 uh, in Kruger. I, I do think that, in theory, the high yield, low impact tourism is good, but it has to be managed and it has to be policed by the National Parks Authority. And that does not happen in Botswana and it does not happen in Zambia, in South Florida either. Sandy? I've been in national parks where I've seen, uh, you know, 30 cars around, one lion, one cheetah, you know. I've been in Botswana where there's been three or four. Now, I'm not there every day, so I don't know what goes on there every day. But, you know, I, I can't, you know, and I'm just speaking for myself, you know, when, oh, sorry, my cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, places like the Serengeti, um, you know, which we're fighting hard to preserve right now. I mean, if it gets any more commercialized, if that road, I'm sorry guys, if the road gets developed, um, I just think it will be a detriment to the park. You know, I mean, there's still enough areas around the park that can be developed. I traveled the road south of the Serengeti. I documented that. It, the destruction is just horrific. And if, Sorry, my cat. And if the road tries to go through the Serengeti, the destruction and the swath of destruction will just will just kill any means of the migration. I'm sorry, I've got a huge Maine Coon cat that wants to get on. You know, stuff. <laughs> I want a Maine Coon cat so bad. <laughs> oh, you can have mine right now. <laughs> Chris, you you lived in the, the the Kalahari for a long time. Did you um, see many instances of of um, bad bad behaviour while you were there from visiting tourists? Uh, Matt, I'm going to, if you don't mind, go back to uh, what Sandy and Tony were talking about Botswana, because that was close to us. Now I've travelled uh, a few years back through from Chobe, through the Lanyanti swamps, um, Savuti to Maun, and then down again. And while I was traveling that section between uh, Chobe and, and Lanyanti swamps, I was going through the most beautiful uh, bush felt, which should have been alive with animals. 
but we were not seeing any animals and uh, there, were, there was no human uh, habitation in the area so I would not have expected a poaching problem. However, we came across a game guards uh, camp and there I saw the reason for it because festooned around this game guards camp were rows and rows of meat drying in the sun. He was making biltong. So it goes back to what Tony was saying about the importance of having a well-disciplined conservation force. If you take an unmotivated um, uh, 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 ill-prepared a person and you give him a conservation uniform, you give him a, a rifle and you give him a Land Rover, all you're doing is setting him up in the meat business. Um, and that's something which we've got to be careful about. So it all stems back to a lot of it is education too. You employ the right people, you teach them what to do. I mean there has to be a model for these people to come in and be able to patrol these areas and know what to do in certain situations. I mean a lot of it is education and you know I think that's you know I don't know where all the revenues that come into these game reserves and national parks go. I don't know what the breakdown is. Um, you know maybe Kruger does it one way you know and the parks in East Africa do it another way Botswana does it another way but you know I don't know where you can even find out information on the breakdown of where the revenues go you know when they come in I mean that would be interesting too to see you know I know for instance I've been you know at KWS in Kenya and I've been to that national orphanage where they had the uh, big rave of, what a few months ago Matt I think it was um, but I saw the grounds of the orphanage compared to what the KWS office buildings and grounds look like I mean I have no idea where the money's going in East Africa so but I, I'd be very interested in to know how much goes back into you know the Rangers how much goes go back into the conservancies how much goes into people's pockets you know what what is the breakdown how do we find out the breakdown I think that's crucial to know perhaps something that, that's that, that yes, can be answered by Peter Peter I, I think it comes back to what uh, what Tony said earlier on, and that is, you know, management structure. Um, you know, again, just using Kruger, it's it's audited. Um, private concessions are audited. Uh, you know, the parks board itself is audited. Each individual park is is audited. Um, in sync with what Sandy is saying, I think that you know a huge amount of this comes down to education. Uh, you know, the Botswana versus South African thing, um, you know, our rate of unemployment in this country is way higher than, than Botswana and, you know, we're sitting at last census on, I don't know, 50, 60 million people, um, depending on who you listen to, but huge influx of, of, of Zimbabweans uh, moving through areas that are, are incredibly rich in, in, in wildlife. So. Um, yeah, you know, all of that has to be managed, and it's it's got to have a very very formal structure around it. Um, accessibility to parks from from a from a conservation uh, perspective is is key and critical, a, a critical part of education as well. And I think it just goes back to what Tony was saying, and that you know, high price, uh, low visitor content, it flies in the face of of education. So. It's very much a case of getting the balance right. I mean, if if you look at Kalahari um, in the Kalahari, which uh, which which Crystal have fond memories of, um, that is another role model establishing itself very very firmly in in the conservation world. But again, very very carefully managed by sandparks. The the whole issue. I want to repeat from a South African perspective, our government is not giving these parks the financial support that they urgently need. Um, and that's going to lead to all sorts of problems. And it's not just the case of supporting the park, it's a case of supporting the settlements that surround it. Um, you know, 
Give them no motivation to go after the bushmeat trade. Give them no motivation to accept five grand to take a rifle and go and shoot a rhino. Um, until we get a handle on that, we're all going to be under pressure, no matter what the model, internally in the park. Coming on from what you've just said, how do we include disenfranchised local communities to the national parks to become involved in conservation? How do we give them stewardship to play a part in the wildlife's um, conservation? How, how do we ensure that money that comes into the national park system also directly benefits them in a tangible way? I guess that the only the, the the real answer to that lies in in uh, in in government. Um, you know, I I just believe that a large portion of the South African education system needs a bit of a revamp. Um, you know, the government has tried uh, placing a lot of emphasis on on um, results based education. Um, the equipping of, of basic skill set and I think that it has, that has to vary from area to area. I don't see anything wrong with the encouragement of an education system in Limpopo that is going to be slightly different to what you're seeing in, in, in Johannesburg. Equipping the, the local population with a skill set that they need to play an active role in conservation in Limpopo, I do not believe is that difficult a problem. Um, and encouraging, uh, you know, the involvement in those people, the recognition of what they have, um, and the reward that is associated with it. And quite honestly, if you if you're looking at a guy who is supporting a family of eight kids, um, and he's he's you know, he's really battling financially. Um, I don't think that he's, his whole focus is on having his kids made an accountant one day. Um, we've, got to, we've got to recognize the contribution that the local population can make um, in growing tourism and in growing conservation in, in our parks. What about this question then? High cost for foreign visitors but low uh, minimal costs of entry costs for, for local communities to get them personally involved in, in the whole idea of, of protecting their environment. I mean, Tony, how does this work in Zimbabwe? Yeah, well, I mean, I think also, Matt, to look at South Africa and Zimbabwe, they both have a similar system where um, your entry fees for the national parks are a two-tiered system. Um, so in South Africa, they have an excellent system. It's called the Wildcard, where uh, basically you can pay a daily entry fee to come into Kruger. A daily entry fee where I am now is 140 rand, which is around about 20 US dollars per day, which is not that far off what you would pay to go into a national park in Zambia or Botswana or even up in East Africa. However, if you're a, if you're going to be staying here uh, about seven days or longer then what you can do is you can buy an annual pass, the annual wildcard, which is a brilliant system. Now that'll cost you about, say, 180 odd US dollars as a foreigner for myself and my wife, but that gives us unlimited entry to every national park in South Africa for a year. So it's a great system. It actually encourages people to spend more time, more of their holiday time in a national park. Zimbabwe has a system where you pay a uh, what is ostensibly a daily entry fee, and a foreigner will pay 20 US dollars, whereas a local will pay about five, but that 20 US dollars allows you to stay from one to seven days. So again, it's a good incentive. The problem I have with, with parks up in East Africa, Tanzania, Kenya, and even Zambia and Botswana is you're always paying day by day, and this gets back to that high yield, low impact thing, which, as I said before, I think is a lot of rubbish. What, one thing that I will pick up on what Sandy said before, that I, I totally support, she asked the $64 million question, where does the money go, you know? Uh, and I think that is the key to this debate, whether it's about commercialisation or how you make money out of parks, whether it's by a rave or a hotel or whatever, or it's just by entry fees. It doesn't really matter if you can see a return on the investment that you're spending. Now, what, what I don't see in some of the countries to the north of South Africa and Zimbabwe that I visit is any evidence that the money I spend on entry is going back into the park. I don't think it's an accident that Namibia, South Africa and Zimbabwe, which 
whose national parks give or take a few problems over the last few years and the last few decades are by and large supported by domestic tourism. Now, part of that's been a function of war and part of that's been a function of apartheid in the old days. But these three countries have survived, their national parks I should say, have survived by and large by domestic tourism. Sure, they've experienced an increase in international tourism in recent years, Zimbabwe has dropped off. Those are the three countries that still have their own uh, homegrown rhinos. I mean, those are the countries that exist as a model of best management for national parks on the continent, Namibia, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. And those are the countries where you will see boots on the ground. You will see rangers on bicycles and in vehicles patrolling every single day of the year. You go further north and further east into Africa, you spend a lot of money to go into a national park, and I have been through many, many, many of these parks where you can drive all day and not see a guy in a green uniform or a girl in a green uniform in the case of South Africa and Namibia in this day. So I think Sandy posed the, the correct question, where does the money go? Sure, I've been to countries like Rwanda where you can definitely see the money that goes into gorilla tracking being ploughed back into the local community and being ploughed back into wildlife conservation. But there's a big gap in the middle of Africa where you pay a lot of money and you don't see the return. So Two-tiered entrance fees, I don't have a problem with. Two-tiered accommodation fees, I think the philosophy is a bit on those. Um, but uh, as long as you can see where the money goes, as Andy says, I, I think that's the key. And talking of, of where the money goes, NGOs, does your dollar really reach the ground uh, with every NGO, or does it support the NGO logistically, wages, uh, the hiring of cars, the paying of, of travel to and from Africa, from America for instance. What are the questions that you should ask an NGO when donating to be sure that your money will assist local communities or will assist wildlife on the ground? I'd like to put that question to Peter. Um, Matt, you know, but geez, uh, I don't know how it works overseas. Um, I'm not sure how it works in in the US. Um, in just speaking from a South African perspective, I think the the important thing is for people to uh, first uh, ask, inquire whether the organisation that they're showing interest in is registered. Um, whether it's registered as a non-profit organization I think is very very important um, and you know the NGOs it, it's a difficult one because you know spots my company is is virtually self-funded but and I've got to be careful about what I say here because I don't want to be detrimental I don't want to be negative or, or insulting to anybody but there's a big difference between what I would call a can rattling operation which is out with a collection cans at uh, various venues and posters of you know dehorned rhino and that um, or poached rhino um, encouraging public participation I, I, you know I just wonder how far whatever money they're collecting um, can go to making a difference and I think Tim Neary said last week and he was quite right that you know if, if, if you approach fundraising in, in that fashion you're quickly going to end up with a population or, or, or a potential contribution base which is like quite rhinoed out at the moment so the, the, the model that we've employed is that we, we encourage um, we first recognize contribution that corporates and the business world can make to conservation and that may be way beyond uh, a financial contribution. At the moment we're working with some of the smartest um, tracking people in the world, um, developing new state-of-the-art GPS tracking solutions which we believe are going to make a big difference in the rhino situation in particular. And the, the, the the corporation's contribution has been intellectual property um, rather than, than, than money. So I think it's very important to understand what you're becoming involved in um, you know, when you do uh, associate or align yourself with a conservation effort. There's nothing wrong um, and you're quite entitled to, to request and to understand what conservation projects they, they are involved in. Um, 
there's been a lot of uh, focus on, on the growth of NGOs down here in South Africa and I think a lot of that has not stemmed from um, you know an opportunistic platform at all. A lot of people down here just believe that our Department of Environmental Affairs is not doing enough um, and there's a wonderful skill set uh, that, that, that applies its mind to this and says well hold on we can make a difference. Um, I would never want to discourage that. I think that uh, you know Tim last week had uh, had had some ideas on that, and he said he felt that there were too many. Um, I just don't I don't agree with that. Um, a lot of these smaller conservation efforts down here are, are doing little things such as placing pressure, um, getting a lot of correspondence in, into environmental affairs, etc., saying, well, you know, why isn't a census being conducted? There are bigger organizations behind that that can steer those efforts. Um, so, you know, anybody out there who, who, who wants to make um, a contribution to, to conservation, I just don't believe should be discouraged in any way. But it is important for the vetting of conservation companies, um, NGOs, uh, and particularly the unregistered ones, to be controlled. Chris, you um, run an NGO, the Campaign Against Canned Hunting. You were very lucky enough to receive a, a large donation which has um, basically eased your need to seek donor funding. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, Matt, you've got to be careful what you wish for. Um, we funded our own uh, wildlife rehab center in the Kalahari for seven years. And then when we started the campaign against canned hunting, we funded that. Um, and in fact, I actually uh, self-funded my trip uh, to Europe and uh, going around the UK giving talks uh, to civic groups, um, wildlife uh, uh, societies, um, Woburn, Safari Park, um, generally interested people. But because I'm an advocacy uh, organization, we don't really need the sort of money that Peter would need at spots because his is a logistical uh, operation. My work is mainly through the internet. And um, as such, I find I'm called upon quite often uh, by people who want to put money into organ organizations, into non-profits, uh, conservation non-profits in South Africa, and my opinion is sought as to whether they are genuine. Uh, and as a general rule of thumb, uh, I would say that the larger the organization, the less effective the use of donor funding. Um, the larger they are, the more funding seems to go into admin and admin seems to require more and more funding um, to support themselves. So it's almost a loop whereby the more you have in admin, the more money they require and the more fundraising they do in order to maintain that administrative setup. And at the end of the day, uh, very little trickles through uh, into service delivery on the ground. So basically, if you are donating to a, an organization or an NGO, be prepared to ask them questions. If they um, want your money, they will answer honestly, uh, quickly and truthfully. And it's important to, to understand that NGOs do have running costs. So an NGO may well say, well, we use 80% of your donation for on-the-ground activities, and we use 20% for logistical costs, such as staff wages, such as petrol for the Land Rovers, such as uh, internet connections. But it all has to go um, into them for them to be able to work and we, we can't deny yes we'd like our hundred percent to to reach the ground but we can't deny that these organizations do have running costs and I think for tonight's show that's where we should leave it you should always ask questions when you are donating 
And what I'd like to do before we uh, before we finish here is give um, Chris, Peter, and Tony a chance to mention their own website uh, as a thank you for them being on the panel tonight, um, so people can can visit them and find out a little bit more about them. So we'll start with Chris. Uh, Matt, thank you. Yes, um, Campaign Against Canned Hunting. The website is cannedlion.org. Okay, if you can if you can put that into the, the, the chat box, Chris, for, for everybody to read. Peter, let us know your, your website so people can find out about your work. Uh, the, the company is Strategic Protection of Threatened Species. The website is www.spots.org.za. Let me just type that in there. Um, we're also on uh, Facebook um, at Spots uh, South Africa. Um, so, yeah, we'd, uh, th those are the details. And Tony, a little bit about your latest book and where we can find out more about yourself. Oh, well, Matt, you know me. I'm a shameless self-promoter, and uh, I would uh, normally just give you my website and say, look for my books on there. You can Google me and my books, but I would rather give you another website, which is www.painteddogconservation.iinet.net.au, and I'll put the link up, uh, which is a charity that I'm the patron of, which is an Aussie-based charity that uh, is involved in conserving the African wild dog or the painted dog. Excellent. Well, thank you very much everybody for taking part tonight. I'd like to remind you all that uh, keeping wildlife conservation in your thoughts is very important and if you can't do something on a great scale then try and do something around you personally to make a difference in the world. This is Matthew Wilkinson signing off from Safari Talk HQ and I hope I'll be seeing you all next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great, great. Bye, y'all. Great. Now, before I stop this recording, oh. does anybody else have a website they want to mention? Sandy or anyone else that didn't? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, for the Serengeti, save the Serengeti dot org. Okay. Anybody else have one they want to mention? Shreyas, Shreyas, your your work with your work with the Serengeti Lion Project. What's their website? Uh, the project's uh, funding uh, request is right here, and if you could check out uh, Serengeti Lion Project, if you just Google this, the, the, this thing, it should pop up. If they, if they Google Serengeti Lion Project. That's right. Okay. Thanks. Sounds good. And Diane? Uh... It has nothing to do with conservation, That's but okay. I'll put it in there. Can you uh, also say it? It's uh, futurecycle.org. Did I type it? Futurecycle.org. F-U-T-U-R-E-C-Y-C-L-E dot O-R-G. Okay. Okay. Well. And if any of you write poetry, it has to do with wildlife conservation. We'd love to see it. And of course, you all know me, safaritalk.net, so feel free to drop by during the week for more informed wildlife conservation talk. Very good. With the membership base there. And, and I'd, I'd like to say, of course, thank you. Um, Thank you to Craig for, for offering to record this for us uh, tonight. Very good. That is a wrap. Yep.